You know, it's the last day of school. <laughs> Normally we would be happy about that, but I have mixed feelings myself. In any case, it's very good to see you all here for what is the last uh, bucket court session uh, of the year. But hey, we came back after the pandemic. It went fine. We're still going, so life is good. I want to take a minute to thank, and I know you will want to join me in doing this, thank the people who serve on the bucket course committee who arranged this. Excellent. I'm even going to name them for you and ask them to stand uh, if they're here. I know. Uh, Carla Erickson, who's our, who recruits our faculty speakers for us, and Carla's not here, but we appreciate her very much. Monique Shore, Steve Lovig. Now, really, if you're in the room, stand up, please. Jack Gustafson, Bob Weimer, Barb Lees, Ben Gunther, Joanne Britton, uh, and our highly esteemed leader, Judy Hunter, and yours truly, Janet Carl. I want to just remind you to turn your phone down, if you haven't already, to turn on your T-coil, to speak into the mic, I'm trying, um, if it comes around to you for a question. That's the only way we can really capture the questions on the YouTube video, so it's important to wait for the mic. And to help put away chairs, if you can, uh, on one of the dollies here or in the back. Well, I am delighted to introduce to you, if you don't know him already, Professor Todd Armstrong, uh, who's going to be our speaker this morning. And I have to tell you that this is Todd's first ever bucket course. Exactly. So I'm saying let's be gentle. Okay. Uh, Todd received his MA and PhD from the Ohio State University. He's chair of the Russian department at Grinnell College. He also serves as a faculty member in the European Studies and the Russian, Central European, and Eurasian Studies concentrations at the college. When I asked him what his hobbies were, he said gardening, uh, vegetable and flowers, and foraging. Want to hear more about that? Uh, Todd's going to talk to us today about food stories. Uh, he, describing his course, Comrades in the Kitchen, in which he and his students work to integrate literary and cultural studies and the evolving field of food studies. Welcome, Todd. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Janet. And thank you, Judy, and also Carla in absentia, and all of the, the uh, bucket course team. Um, it's a real honor to be here. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm a little nervous, and, but Carla promised me that you're a gentle crowd. Um, thank you for the introduction, uh, Janet. Uh, I'm just winding up my 29th year at the college. Um, I'm originally from Montana, but I find myself more and more when asked where am I from, I'll say from Iowa. Um, and I may say some more about that in a little bit. Um, my other uh, hobby, passion, and something I've integrated into my work life is cooking. And you'll see that unfold here on the screen. I just want to say real briefly what the structure of our time here together will be. Um, it'll, uh, my presentation in, is in three parts. And in the first part, I'm going to talk about analysis. Um, and that is the kinds of work I do in terms of my research and, and what I've uh, uh, presented on at academic conferences and so on, and some of the work I do in my courses uh, where, I, where we do need to uh, think about how to write, read, think critically, and so on. That said, we also engage in practice and experiential learning in the classroom, and that's where uh, uh, working in the kitchen uh, comes in. And then in the last part, I'm going to speak about action. Um, and that is, how do we respond when we think about access to food? Um, if we're sitting around in a, in a uh, liberal arts college enjoying 
uh, a nice meal together. What about those who have not? And I'll have a lot more to say about that and what, how we can uh, take action. Those three parts are also the three parts of my uh, fall tutorial, which will be called Food Stories. So in a way, I'm testing out the structure of my uh, course this fall. Um, and I want to quickly welcome some of my comrades uh, from last semester. Um, Bob Gray, Karen Phillips, uh, Joe Entwistle, and Nancy Brown, who attended my course along with 15 Grinnell students, and I'll have occasion to talk about that as well. Um, this first part is I'm going to call Food in Literature. Um, I'm going to dedicate this to uh, Joan Mullen, uh, who we lost uh, this year, and John, her, uh, her spouse, who we all still miss. Um, and uh, I'll have a little bit more to say about that. I use this image here. This is a lunch that Joan prepared for me. And we had a, a custom of meeting once or twice a month, or a semester probably, uh, in our busy lives, and sharing food. And we, we used to go out, but we started cooking for each other. And this, uh, always, uh, uh, this image makes me smile because it brings back a really fond memory uh, of Joan. And in that sense, I, I want us always to think about food stories as memories and ways to connect to our past and ways to connect to each other. And again, I'll have a lot more to say about that as well. Um, so uh, what I'm really going to talk about in this first part is the function of food imagery in literature. And I'll use some examples from uh, Dostoevsky, um, and I'll, I'll hope you'll follow along. You're going to see a little bit of Russian text, um, I, I, but with English translation, and I'll explain uh, how that works. Um, or why I chose to do that. And I have a little bit of text, but uh, I, I've tried to keep text on screen to a minimum. Um, I know what uh, death by PowerPoint, um, I'm aware of that in the classroom. Okay, So uh, food imagery and Dostoevsky. Um, and I'm going to start with crime and punishment. And I have here a jar of soup, um, which is, this is a jar of Xi, which is a traditional Russian uh, cabbage soup that is, uh, is part of uh, Russian identity. It's a, uh, it goes back to ancient times. It is, uh, uh, if, if someone were to ask you uh, what uh, a fundamental Russian soup would be, this should be what comes to mind. I know that many of us might think borscht, and I'll have a lot to say about that towards the end of the uh, presentation. I'm going to go here to uh, a quote from a, a critic, a literary critic, who wrote uh, about food imagery in Dostoevsky. And he has this uh, passage here, and I'm going to read this out loud. If one were foolhardy enough to venture forth in search of the mythical culinary Dostoevsky, one would quickly discover a world where food is generally stripped of much of its traditionally strong positive value as the source of life, as the main provider of physical nourishment, vitality, and health for the human body. The act of eating in Dostoevsky's fictional universe is more likely to be negatively rather than positively valorized because it is so often associated with the prurient, the perverse, and the pathological, with very few exceptions. Uh, let me, as an aside, this particular critic uh, seems to have a bit of an obsession with these themes, and he does this in a lot of different literary works. But for me, why do I bring this up is when I was reading this uh, art article and I was preparing for the first time, I taught this uh, course, Comrades in the Kitchen, and I was trying to find all I could about food imagery and literature. And as I read this, something really bothered me. Um, and it was because it, wa it was as if I was reading a description of an author I hadn't read before. Because when I read Dostoevsky, I see something different, especially in terms of food. And why is that the case? At the end of the semester, as we have made our way through some very thick readings, uh, Dostoevsky is very long-winded, uh, one might say, um, as a way to sort of uh, ease ourselves out of the semester and to celebrate having uh, accomplished quite a great deal, I would always have students over to my house uh, to share a meal. This is something I, um, I, am, I took on um, a, a, in a way that was similar to what John Mullen used to do, although I will say that Joan prepared that meal. Uh, maybe a little bit more about that later. Um, but I had, I had struggled, or I had uh, enjoyed finding different food items throughout his text to prepare for 
uh, a meal together with students, right? To gather together, break bread, connect, give them a little bit of respite as, we, as they entered into finals week and, and prepared their final papers. Um, and I had found a lot. Um, and here I'm reading this uh, passage and thinking, who is, who, what, is this, uh, what is this guy doing? And it occurred to me, and maybe this is why I'm thinking of John a little bit, is that this person probably doesn't cook food, has not thought about food as a real thing, but rather as an abstraction in a literary text. And he had missed many of the images that really spoke to me, uh, one of which is she. Um, and I'll, uh, uh, by the way, who has read Crime and Punishment? All right, good. Um, so in Crime and Punishment, and this is in Russian, uh, please don't be afraid. Um, so the reason I put this up here, and, and you'll see the bold face and the underlined uh, words, those are all references to she. And it's repeated again and again and again. And the repetition generates a kind of a semantic weight. And it becomes clear that Dostoevsky is trying to tell us something through this particular image. Further, he, he mentions that it's yesterday's she. And as everybody knows, yesterday's she is much better. She is a better soup when you let it sit overnight. Um, and so uh, let me go to the English, OK? Uh, the loaf I'll fetch you this very minute, but wouldn't you ra uh, I'll fetch you this very minute, but wouldn't you rather have some cabbage soup instead of sausage? It's capital soup, yesterday's. I saved it for you for uh, yesterday, but you came in late. It's fine soup. When the soup had been brought and he had begun uh, upon it, Nastasia sat down beside him on the sofa and began chatting. She was a country peasant woman and a very talkative one. So this is at a moment when Raskolnikov, right, the hero of uh, the protagonist of Crime and Punishment, is preparing his plan to go murder a pawnbroker, right? And he's, he is vacillating. He's not sure he's going to do it. He's imagining it and so on. And Nastasia is, is a country peasant woman, and peasants in Dostoevsky's fiction have a very important uh, role as pointing the, the way to uh, a, a, a proper reading of culture of, uh, and an embrace of Russian uh, ideas. And Raskolnikov has been polluted by foreign ideas and philosophies, and he is, has been led astray. And so in this very little passage, uh, Nastasia is pointing him in the right direction. Further, she's saying, wouldn't you rather have this instead of sausage, which he has asked for? And in the Orthodox uh, Church, there are over 180 fasting days, right? It's a very, very, um, uh, it's a, a religion that uh, practices discipline in terms of diet and is very observant. And so she is steering him towards a, a, a more religious um, uh, understanding uh, of the world. And he ignores her, as we know, and he does go off to, uh, to kill the pawnbroker. But this is a moment in the text where there's an opportunity for him to take the proper path. Um, you'll see here in the translation, we do get cabbage soup, but then it's repeated as soup. And it doesn't have the same impact as the original Russian does. And in that sense, this is part of my work, is to try to uh, bring out what happens in a Russian text, consider issues of translation. Uh, with, uh, with my students and uh, think about how we might understand the work knowing it's uh, the Russian and the, what happens in the original and what happens in the text itself. Um, this is not mentioned in this critical article that I mentioned. There's no mention of, of these other ones that I'm going to show you as well, um, which I'll go ahead and um, go further. Um, and let's see. I'll go to uh, Brothers Karamazov. Uh, Brothers K, is, uh, that's f maybe a few or that's a, a large read, but it's a really a, a fabulous book, and I highly recommend it. And this passage that I'm offering here is when Ivan Karamazov says to his brother Alyosha, how about some cherry jam? They have it here. Remember when you were young, you used to love cherry jam at Palyonov's. Um, and the cherry jam is he's offering his brother this, uh, this uh, food item in a, a tavern right before he embarks on his great rebellion against God. Um, and he tells the story of the Grand Inquisitor, a text that does challenge a world in which children suffer um, and, and really uh, brings out the main questions in, in the novel. Further, cherry jam is also something that 
Alyosha, um, Yvonne's brother, uh, his, his spiritual father, Father Zosima, who's uh, sort of the spiritual guide in the novel, also likes cherry jam. And in the monastery, there are those who think that that is a little bit too much, that he's enthralled by um, earthly pursuits and so on, and condemn him for it. But uh, Dostoevsky offers a more gentle version of discipline, and he sees in this a celebration of connection. And in the case of Ivan, this again is sort of like a lifeline, his memory of his brother, of this time together, and of a, of a treasured moment where he offers um, a, a loved one some food. Um, another example is uh, uh, these, uh, this food item, blini, or crepes, or pancakes in the translation. And this is also from Brothers Karamazov, and it's at the very uh, end. And it's, um, it's Alyosha, the hero of the novel, and he has gathered around him a number of small boys, about 12, which is symbolic, right? Um, and it's at this stone that this uh, poor boy um, has asked them to pray at, a boy who has died uh, recently. And it's a really heart-wrenching uh, and, and uh, touching moment. And, and the grief is, is, is so powerful. And one of the small children says, the landlady is laying the table for them now. There will be a funeral dinner or something. The priest is coming. Shall we go back to it, Karamazov? Of course, said Alyosha. It's all so strange, Karamazov, such sorrow, and then pancakes after it. It all seems so unnatural in our religion. And it's a question, um, questioning this sort of uh, proper uh, aspect of this and how um, Perhaps it's morally wrong to celebrate life and to join together and enjoy food when someone has just died, right? At the same time, if we think about it, what do we do after a funeral? Is we gather and share food together. And I'm remembering the wonderful uh, uh, potluck we had at St. Uh, at St. Mary's after Joan's funeral uh, earlier this year. Um, after this uh, statement, Alyosha then goes on. Uh, to make a very important speech to the 12 boys, his 12 disciples, if you will, or apostles, uh, representing the apostles, perhaps. And he uh, encourages them to remember this moment together, to love each other, to do good uh, for one another. And after that speech at the, at the stone, uh, which he's brought his, his, the children together in this moment, this very touching moment, um, he says, well, now we will finish talking and go to his funeral dinner. Don't be put out uh, at our eating pancakes. It's a very old custom, and there's something nice in that. And it's, it's a sort of a, an affirmation of the possibility of moving beyond suffering, of celebrating life together, and of comforting each other at a moment of sorrow. Um, pancakes here, and I'll, I'll just uh, an aside, um, uh, earlier this year, uh, I also had a death in my family. I lost my brother um, to cancer. And um, when I got back, uh, to, uh, he, it was out in Montana, and I got back here, and that week afterwards, it was a difficult week, also because um, I happened to come down with COVID as well. Damn that thing. Um, and uh, I, found, I, I, I found, I had this urge to make blueberry pancakes, f just for myself. I, um, and I realized as I was eating them, I made them because that's what I used to make for my children um, to comfort them. And so I was trying to comfort myself through food. And I think uh, that's something that really speaks to me. Um, let me uh, go on to another work. Um, and this is um, from the uh, Notes from the House of the Dead or Notes from a Dead House. This is also by Dostoevsky. And it's a really interesting and less well-known work. It's one of the first works of prison literature. It's a memoir of his time in Siberia, in the labor camps of the Tsarist era. He, uh, uh, Dostoevsky spends time in exile and in, and in, and in uh, jail, and he writes a, a very um, interesting memoir about um, his time there. And he spends a, a great deal of time talking about the incarcerated and their, in, and their humanity. He um, also focuses on charity as part of, the, uh, of his experience there, of seeing how ordinary people help these, uh, these poor uh, prisoners um, in Siberia. Um, 
the work itself is a, an expose of, of the czarist uh, penal system. And, and here it's also, for me, another response to this critic, right? This is a, a novel that offers a way to think about um, how we uh, interact with each other and what Dostoevsky found really important. And here, um, this is a, he's observing how uh, alms are given and how people bring food to the uh, labor camp and give it to the prisoners. Um, this is around the holiday time. And gifts were brought in extraordinary quantities. There were rich gifts, bread made of the finest flour with butter and eggs and sent in large quantities. There were also very poor gifts, a cheap little white loaf and two black buns of indifferent quality barely smeared with sour cream. A gift to a beggar from a beggar out of his last small store. All were received with equal gratitude without any distinction of gifts or givers. Um, and so these, these several examples come from a, a paper I did. I, I called it An Appetite for Peace towards a Culinary Dostoevsky. Um, and I presented it at Montreal, at a conference in Montreal from Grinnell because it was the pandemic, but nonetheless. Um, Okay, so um, so this has become part of my research, and um, it's also be, been very important in my teaching. And now I want to uh, I want to uh, go move on to part two, which I'll call practice and comrades in the kitchen. This part I'd like to dedicate to my students and my students here in the room, and also the many uh, generations of Grinnell students who have been my comrades in the kitchen. Um, and have taken this course, um, uh, Russian and Soviet Food Culture, um, and I may have a, something to say about that title a little later, and where we cook to learn. And um, this is a phrase that it was coined by um, uh, two uh, professors uh, who teach a course called um, uh, uh, Democracy in the Kitchen, John Dewey's Philosophy of Education Through Cooking and Eating. It was a course I took online also during the pandemic at the University of Vermont. And they, uh, uh, they really uh, helped me think about how experiential learning in the kitchen can bring a really important extra dimension to how students uh, work together um, in the classroom and how they build knowledge within the kitchen. And there's some really important things that happen in that space as we cook together. Um, as I'm sure my uh, comrades in the room will attest um, and, and will um, uh, verify. Um, and so uh, where do we do this? Oh, by the way, this is, uh, this is actually me um, in Moscow in 1983 in a Soviet kitchen um, many, many years ago. Um, and I, I share that with my students to give them a sense of the fact that I used to have hair, I guess. Um. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and all right, so this is the Global Kitchen at Grinnell College. Now, um, th uh, it's a liberal arts college, um, um, high pressured academic uh, institution, and at the heart of the new building at the Husk or the HSSC is a teaching lab that is a kitchen. Um, I was part of the planning process for that space um, over many years. And the discussion about having a kitchen in the, in the building was something that I was very excited about. I had used a kitchen in uh, the student center, which was somewhat inadequate. Um, and I was really eager to have a space like this. But I also knew that it would be an important space for other people in the community, um, uh, including uh, my uh, faculty colleagues, staff colleagues, and students in, in particular. Um, this is this image here um, is of its first usage. Um, it's not up to code. It scares me a little when I think back on it. Um, we didn't have much equipment, and um, I brought uh, everything to cook with from my own kitchen um, and supplied it and so on. We've come a long way. Um, and so when we built this kitchen, uh, we didn't also have a, a process by which we could determine how it would function. And I was fortunate to be in, the, in a position to ask for funding to get it started. And I'm happy to say um, this, is 20, uh, this is spring of 2019 when it was first opened. And in spring of 23, we have a permanent uh, position that supports the, the kitchen, the Global Kitchen Culinary Coordinator, David Stanley, who I'm sure many of you know. And we also have a team of Global Kitchen peer mentors, students who help assist uh, and assist 
faculty and, and student groups and, and whoever is using the kitchen in doing this uh, properly because it's an incredible amount of work and it's very complicated and it, and it requires uh, an infrastructure and I'm happy to say it, it really is working. Um, and I've, in, I've taught in this space now, um, this course, I think five times, four or five times. And I'm looking forward this fall to, to doing so as well. Um, let me share another image. So this is my fall 21 tutorial, Comrades in the Kitchen. Now, um, you can't see their smiles, but their eyes are smiling. And I can see that if you look really close. Um, and this was when we came back from the pandemic. Um, and it was a very difficult time. It was really hard to teach in masks. It was hard to establish community. There was a, we had all become unaccustomed to being together. There was a certain amount of anxiety. Um, and this space and this course brought us together in this really powerful way. And I would say that over the course of maybe two or three classes, I knew these students uh, better than I've known students after an entire semester. And in fact, I ran into uh, Guo Chen on the, on the left here this morning on my way here, actually. And he said, aren't we going to do a, t a reunion this year? Um, and uh, we did a tutorial reunion last year. And this is a group that's still very uh, close. Um, and they, I, I think for them, this was also a way f for them to return to campus and to return to community. Um, I had this really wonderful moment uh, with a, a senior, a fourth year student, who came to do an, um, an interview with my group. And uh, she was uh, surveying uh, uh, some questions uh, for a project. And then we had some Q&A. And I, I asked her, you know, Sophie, do you have any advice for my, my group? Uh, you know, these are first years, uh, you know, and you, you have uh, experience here. And she paused and thought, and she said, learn how to cook a good meal. And I, I didn't plan that, uh, but I sort of said, that's what we're doing, right? So um, it was a really a, a, a nice moment. Um, um, so uh, we've developed the space. We've established a process by which it can be used effectively and uh, safely. And, um, and we've really embraced experiential learning and its values, uh, value and benefits. I'm going to share just a, a couple of things that students have said about uh, teaching or learning how to, or cooking to learn in the global kitchen. This is from Maggie Beltramo, uh, one of our soccer stars on the women's team. And she put it this way, preparing and sharing Soviet food in class added a whole new dimension to learning about Soviet culture. It added play, joy, and a feeling of giddiness to class, which is rare, especially in a high-stress academic environment. Um, they also were also doing high-stress academic things and writing papers and taking exams and so on. But this changed the way they approached it and gave them a better access to that in the same way, perhaps, that my cooking from Dostoevsky gave me a window into his works that was quite different and that allowed me to make a different kind of interpretation than, uh, than the critic I mentioned. The other uh, statement is a little longer. And I, this is from Zoe Fruchter of class of 20, which was a hard year to graduate from college or to do anything, certainly. Um, and she writes, and this is uh, literally uh, the week after students had heard that they have to go home. And that was a very difficult moment at the college. As I write this, students are in the process of leaving Grinnell College, not by choice, but out of necessity, in order to protect the most vulnerable in our community from the COVID-19 virus, today officially classified as a pandemic. We've been directed to continue our classes online in order to finish our semesters, our degrees, to video conference instead of congregate in person. As a student said in a town hall today about the virus, a remote education is undoubtedly less valuable of a liberal arts education. What we are losing in terms of academic and social learning is symbolized by my experience in this class of using the Global Kitchen. Learning in the hands-on manner which the Global Kitchen not only accommodates but engenders is the type of learning which represents the best of the liberal arts. Learning that cannot be quantified, teaching that is dispersed among students and faculty alike, skills that extend beyond the course description to the rest of your life. Cooking in particular is a symbol of the trust that we all have for each other here, the knowledge that each of us brings to the table, 
and the strength and flexibility of the ties which we are able to build at this institution. This is a, a phrase I've used many times. Cooking is community that you can consume. And it is this type of community that I, that I will miss the most as we transition to a remote online mode of education. Uh, thank goodness we're back, uh, back from that, uh, from the pandemic and continuing on. But I think that she makes some really powerful points. Uh, and then I want to make sure and get my last version of comrades. And uh, you'll see here, I think, Nancy and Karen uh, with my group of, of uh, comrades. And in the center of the, um, of the table there, because uh, anybody re uh, identify that it's a fungus? It's a giant puffball. Um, so speaking to my hobby of foraging, there's lots of food around us in the, uh, in the forest and community, right? Uh, right here, yeah. Um, and so I brought that. Unfortunately, when we cut it open, it, was, it had already gone bad, so we couldn't cook it. But it's the thought that counts. Um, I've also, there's, right now there's ramps. Um, if anybody has any secret sources of morels, I will pay you. Um, <laughs> um, actually, I'm, as I look at this, uh, this particular um, image, we were making a dish called katlete, or, or um, uh, sort of meat patties. And, uh, and since we uh, weren't using pork because there were some Muslim students in, in the class, um, we were using chicken. Um, and, and you can see here on the bottom right, we're we, I brought a grinder. We were actually grinding our own chicken to make this, these ground uh, meat patties. Um, it, was a, it was a class where traditionally I, our, uh, uh, we usually uh, meet in the kitchen for an hour. It's usually a seminar-style format. And then we um, have discussion and, and work on academic matters for another um, hour. This class quickly, it quickly became obvious to me that we weren't going to get back in the classroom. And so this is also one of the, I think, one of the things that students learn in a, a kitchen context is the need to be flexible, the need to be able to pivot. And oh boy, we all got tired of that word during the pandemic, we need to pivot. But we really need to be able to think about ways around obstacles and challenges and work together to find solutions. And I know that for one student in particular, this is one of his favorite classes. And I have a picture of him with a grin. As, uh, a mile wide because we just we, we really had a, a fun time and uh, the food was the cutlets really turned out well so after every class we I'll, we usually I, if we can't share it together I would send food home with students um, here since we were masking it was more difficult to share food in the classroom uh, so uh, we did I did send food home with them I've built that into the budget of our department to, for supplies and so on. There's lots of details in this kind of, uh, of, in this kind of teaching. Um, so those are several uh, pictures of the Global Kitchen. The course itself, Comrades in the Kitchen, I use a, a, a book that um, I highly recommend um, by uh, Anya von Bremsen, who's been to the college and, and gave a talk, and for whom my tutorial of 2015 prepared a, a meal for when she came to give a, a talk on campus. Um, and it's called Mastering the Art of Soviet Cooking, a Memoir of Food and Longing. And it's a, a, a work that um, takes as a conceit the division of the 20th century into decades. So it's very convenient in terms of structuring a course. And for each decade, um, she and her mother chose a dish to prepare that would give you insights into what that, the history of that particular decade looks like in the Soviet context. So for the 19-teens, uh, 1910s, it's a luxurious Tsarist uh, dish called kulibyaka, which involves all kinds of different ingredients and which, would have, uh, which demonstrates the ostentatiousness of the Russian aristocracy um, and perhaps points us in the direction of revolution, right? There were, the one percenters in, in Tsarist Russia uh, were, uh, were living um, high on the hog, and the per, per, uh, majority of the population was living on very little. So uh, the 1910s, um, I'll give you a couple other examples. The 1940s doesn't have a recipe in it because of the war and the, the hunger years and the siege of Leningrad, uh, which, um, which uh, was uh, a time of great deprivation. 
Um, I'm giving here the dates of the Great Patriotic War, which is how World War II is known in uh, Russian. Uh, and the dates, uh, the years 1941-45, have become fixed in uh, the Russian imagination and in um, Putin's uh, propaganda machine that wants to imagine uh, the current situation as a, a, a repetition of the war years and, uh, and hence leads to these accusations of Nazism in Ukraine, uh, which is part of his um, completely unwarranted un and foundless uh, claims and part of the, uh, the egregious aggression that we're seeing right now in the full-scale invasion of Ukraine um, it, that happened in February of uh, 2022 and which continues today. Um, and as I'm sure many of you know. Um, I may, I'll have more to say about that further in, the, in my uh, talk as well, I think. How are we doing on time, Janet? Uh, okay, great. Um, the next, uh, this is also, I want to uh, make a connection here to the, um, the way that we, uh, the way that the United States um, interacts with Russia is often through food. Um, in 1919, there was the uh, there was a um, the Russian Relief Act, and there was a great amount of money um, uh, uh, designated for hunger relief after World War One and the and the Russian Revolution and the Russian Civil War in the 1920s. And in the, and during the war years, there was an effort to help Russia, um, uh, the Soviet Union, through uh, supplying them with various um, um, goods. Um, uh, equipment. Um, there were a lot of Studebakers and Jeeps in, in the Soviet Army um, in the 40s, and also food. And this, uh, this, these cans here are. It's a, just a, a canned uh, uh, pork. Um, it's called tushonka. These were made in Cincinnati, Ohio, right? And they were shipped over as part of Lend-Lease and, and a, a way to support the Red Army as they were trying to uh, fend off the um, the Nazi invaders. Um, and I bring this in because it's still a very, very well-known and beloved dish. And you can find this in very many different flavors because it is the, um, the 21st century. Uh, but you can find this uh, um, in Russian supermarkets today um, as, as an item produced in Russia. But it comes out of, uh, of an American a recipe, which I, I think is quite interesting and helps us see some of the sociological, political um, um, uh, kinds of ways in which the Soviet Union and America interacted. Um, and, and through food, we get this lens on those relationships. Um, the next uh, chapter, another chapter is the 1950s. And this, is, uh, this, this one um, is featuring a, um, a book, uh, a cookbook, uh, an iconic cookbook in the Soviet era, uh, first written in the um, uh, late 30s and then reissued over, over time, and it became very popular in the 1950s. I have a copy of one. Yes, are we, are we ready? Okay, all right. Um, and the book of Tasty and Healthy Food, uh, you could, this is the frontispiece uh, in the inside cover, and it's a, a, a thick book, um, and it features recipes um, uh, from across the Soviet Union, um, and also includes all kinds of different um, health advice and how to uh, 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 do things properly in the kitchen, sanitation, and so on. Um, and very scientific. It's very much part of the Soviet um, embrace of science as a way to uh, for better living. And um, the reason I bring this uh, image up is because it also is a helpful way for me to talk about uh, an aspect of Soviet culture and Soviet literature and art that's very important. And this is what's known as the uh, as socialist realism. Um, this was a, a mode of art and representation during the Soviet era. And this was, um, in, in essence, socialist realism uh, demands of the artist just the fact that there's a demand made of the artist ought to be a, a kind of a red light, or a red flag, excuse me, pun intended perhaps. Um, red flags and, and, and communists, right? Um, and uh, so this is not reality as it is, but as it should be in its revolutionary development. 
right? In other words, portray reality. We're not interested in objective facts, right? That's uh, bourgeois formalism, right? We're interested in a higher truth and reality as it should be in uh, its revolutionary development, right? And so um, literature becomes very formulaic. Um, John Mullen used to joke, you know, boy falls in love with tractor and they live happily ever after. Um, films become very uh, less experimental. Um, art becomes uh, very standard themes, realistic, uh, portraying the worker, the peasant, uh, the glories of the new state, and so on. Um, and, and really dispense with some of the uh, really dynamic and creative energies of the early Soviet years, where we saw the Russian avant-garde, where we saw experimentation in the arts, the, the, really the, um, the creation of cinema in many ways happens in, in Russia, um, and they are making great strides in uh, techniques like montage and so on. And everything falls into this um, top-down control of arts, culture, and food, right? And the irony here is that none of these, very few of these foods would be, have been available, right? Many of the recipes would be unrealizable because the ingredients simply didn't exist. Some of the additions they had to edit down because they were so outlandish in terms of what they were um, offering as, as possibilities for people to eat. Uh, during the war years, they also uh, uh, created, uh, they were a little more responsive and, and created cookbooks that uh, offered strategies on how to survive um, um, uh, shortages and so on. <clears throat> this table, though, is, is would be something that would be very unusual, it would be only available to the, the party elite or in, in foreign currency restaurants and, and so on. So it's a really um, helpful uh, or th this, this uh, particular image in this, this book is a way to understand some of those dynamics in Soviet history and culture that can sometimes be less um, tangible, if you will. Um, okay, um, I believe that recipe here, are we at 10, four, let's, let's stop right here, 10 minute break. Okay. All right. All right. Um, welcome back to class. And and if if uh, I hope that things have been clear up till now. And if you have questions, maybe we'll have a little bit of time at the end. Um, and thank you to those of you who came up and and talked to me about personal connections. I think there's always lots, and in, in, in and we'll find some more and connection between Russia and Iowa. Um, there's some really important ones that I'll talk about in this next slide. But before I get going, um, I have a note to myself, uh, something that I did omit in this second part, uh, which I call practice, right? And that is uh, my, my sort of most important informant and amuse and someone who taught me much of what I know about cooking in the Soviet kitchen. I realized as I got started in this kind of teaching that I didn't have a wide repertoire of Soviet dishes. I mean, I knew some of the standard uh, fare, but I didn't have a, a real depth of knowledge. And that is uh, my fiance, Olga Baldwin, who um, lives in Newton, but teaches uh, gymnastics in Grinnell. Um, some of you may know her as Miss Olga. She's taught many generations of Grinnell children. Um, and so she has been, she's really been uh, a part of this teaching, and I want to acknowledge that. Um, also, I'll move on to another uh, con a connection with Iowa, and that's when uh, Nikita Khrusho, uh, Khrushchev, or Khrushchev, as you sometimes will hear it pronounced in, in English transliteration, and he comes to Iowa in 1959, and he visits the Garst family in Coon Rapids. And it was really, really a landmark event in US-Soviet relations. I'm seeing some nodding heads, so this is a, a familiar event, I'm sure, to many of you. Um, and you see in that painting, the painting hangs in uh, the World Food Prize uh, in, in Des Moines, a place I highly recommend um, visiting. Um, and it's devoted to thinking about hunger in the world. And um, it was founded um, on Norm Borlaug's work in, uh, um, in inventing new ways of, of developing seed and feeding the world. And one of the phrases in the, um, in the building, which is the former Des Moines Public Library, 
um, says uh, that he is uh, he's credited with having saved more lives than anyone in history. Um, in any event, um, Khrushchev comes to Iowa in 1959. He visits the Garst family, one of the children of whom is John Crystal, uh, after whom this building that I can see over here, the Crystal Center, is named. So there was a, a strong connection with Grinnell College also uh, with the Garst family. And Khrushchev was incredibly impressed by American livestock and, and American corn. Um, and, he, um, and this is another chapter in, um, in Anya von Bremsen's work, the 1960s, and it has to do with corn. Um, he seizes on corn as a, as a possible solution to some of the food issues that are facing the Soviet Union. He is, uh, there's a, um, a movement to uh, generate more meat production because that was seen as a, a healthier diet. It's a different era, certainly. Um, and so um, growing feed corn became something that he was very interested in and he imports corn to the Soviet Union. Um, unfortunately, that was, uh, there were good intentions, but the uh, realization of this project was less than successful. Um, he was mocked uh, widely. He was called the cornhead or kukuruznik, um, and he was. It it really failed because of the conditions of agriculture and the Soviet system were such that it it simply didn't um, it, it didn't uh, succeed. Um, it also um, um, it, it's a kind of an experiment that it becomes a disaster. Although in my classes, we, we talk about corn because as we all know, we can go to the edge of town and, and find that corn. Um, incidentally, as an aside, I, I was a, as a grad student at Ohio State University, and I'd never seen seed corn grown before. So when I saw these uh, agricultural fields uh, next to married student housing uh, with corn in them, I thought I might borrow a couple of ears. I, I found out quickly that that's not Humphrey's sweet corn, let's say. <laughs> um, and so, but it, it gives us an occasion also to talk about what corn means in uh, our culture, right? And the fact that we can go to a gas station and fill up our car and then go buy high corn syrup uh, drinks and, and foods that are filled with sugar uh, made from corn and points to some of the, uh, and the disastrous effects of, of uh, some of the disastrous effects. I'm not anti-agriculture, uh, but um, it has uh, compromised some of the um, uh, environment in Iowa. I think it can be argued, and that's certainly something that is uh, important to think about in the context of, of food. Um, let me, um, and in this sense, I'll transition to the last part of, of my talk, and that is, um, but, you know, everybody has a food story, right? But not everybody's food story is a good one. And what do we do about bad food stories? And I want to start here with a mention of, uh, of an event that um, I, I hope everybody now is aware of. Um, the Holodomor is a, um, a, a man-made man famine or a, a famine caused by a, a policy. Um, it has been... Uh, termed a genocide by the U.S. Senate um, fairly recently, but it's a story that was really little known. Uh, just as, uh, who has heard of the Holodomor? Okay, um, so that's not very many people, right? This is a famine that took place in, in uh, Soviet Ukraine in the 1930s. It is, uh, the numbers are staggering, something like four million people starve to death um, because the grain in Ukraine is confiscated by the Soviet authorities um, towards the cause of collectivization and the decimation of an entire class, the so-called Kulak class, which was, um, it was a way of describing the so-called rich peasantry. It was really a way to of enforce collectivization and to support industrialization of the country. And they literally starved entire villages. They would confiscate all of the grain, all of the seed corn, everything that they had, all of their cooking utensils. And these villages died, right, um, uh, wholesale. And just to give you a sense of, of the scale, um, whoops, that's the wrong one. Um, I, well, actually, let me stop with this. So this is the propaganda that goes out, right? This is the first sheaf 
towards the industrialization of the USSR, um, all, hail the day of harvest and collectivization. This is a, a holiday of the new socialist village, right? This is 1930. Meanwhile, across Ukraine, these are, uh, this is a, a series of, uh, of uh, charts that show excess deaths per year, um, and those numbers are um, in uh, thousands, right? So 991.5 in 1931 in one of these. So you can see this dramatic uh, death rate in Ukraine, right? The fact that we don't know about it seems to me to be almost a crime. Um, and the fact that I, as a Soviet and Russian specialist or someone who studied the region for many years, who went through a graduate program and so on, and also knew very little about it. It was not talked about. It wasn't part of our understanding of the Soviet experience. Why? This is, uh, there's a lot of reasons, but I think one way to think about it is there was a, um, an intense effort on the part of the Soviet authorities to russify the country, right? Um, and also to um, eliminate the class and also to, to um, hide this story, right? And so the suppression of any mention of the Holodomor or the Great Hunger um, is in, in Ukrainian um, was such that almost nobody in the Soviet Union knew about it either unless you were from Ukraine, right? So this is, this is part of Ukraine's history that is very important to keep in mind when we think about the current conflict, uh, the aggression of, of Russia into Ukrainian uh, territory. Um, Kazakhstan had a similar famine before this one in 1930 with similar effects. Uh, this was more aimed at um, decreasing Kazakh representation in, in the uh, country um, and something along the lines of one to two million uh, people perish from starvation and many people flee Kazakhstan and this is from a 68% um, popula uh, um, 68 of the population of the Kazakh uh, Socialist Republic went down to about 30 percent. So imagine that demographic shift um, as a result of, of uh, policy-induced famine. Um, and these are really important stories that were not uh, that were very little known. Um, if we think about um, this 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 kind of policy. Um, uh, that results in famine, we can also take uh, the case of China and the Great Leap Forward, and the numbers there are even more staggering. Um, it's oh, I think it's something over 20 million people die in the Great Leap Forward because of collectivization and the, um, the suppression of private ownership of, of property and of land. Um, I had in my first tutorial, Comrades in the Kitchen, a student from China, and when we were talking about this uh, context, um, she sort of, uh, her, uh, she's perked up and she said, this reminds me of stories my grandparents told me, how their kitchens were confiscated, right? All the metal was being funneled towards industrialization and they were all to uh, meet together and eat in communal dining halls. Um, and then the communal dining halls, of course, fail or don't have enough. And then people didn't have enough to cook with, didn't have enough to eat. And so it, it becomes a more part of a global question of how policy can result in some really, uh, really uh, terrible, terrible crimes. Um, uh, okay, so um, call them more. Um, okay. Um, Keep going. Whoops. Um, now I'm going to turn to another um, a, a, um, bad food story, and this um, has to do with my own uh, work um, in um, Holocaust studies and Polish literature. So my secondary area of specialization in graduate school was Polish literature. I spent a year in Poland, 1984-1985. Um, this was post Solidarity. Those were some really grim years. I, we had ration cards, and so food was, uh, was, uh, was in short supply, um, and it was an interesting period to be there. And I also did a lot of work studying um, the Holocaust, and, and I spent a lot of time in another course with uh, uh, trying to, um, uh, with reading literary responses to um, the Holocaust in Polish, right? Um, and we focus in on 1943 in Poland and the Warsaw Ghetto um, and the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. 
Um, and I brought this image in and this, this quote that the Warsaw Ghetto was the largest of all Jewish ghettos in Nazi-occupied Europe during World War II. Ration cards allowed ghetto residents only 300 calories of food daily, a small fraction of, for sustaining health. An official order dated April 19, 1941 states that the basic provisioning of the Jewish residential district must be less than the minimum necessary for preserving life, regardless of the consequences. These are, hu these are policy decisions. These are efforts to uh, destroy another uh, group. These are, uh, uh, this is evidence of, of genocide, clearly. Um, and these are uh, really important um, uh, moments in, in our history that we need to continue to think about and to fight against, certainly. Um, I'm remind, um, and here I'm reminded, or, or I'll, I'll offer a couple of uh, examples from the literature that we read um, for this course um, on Central East European literature. We read a, a collection of short stories by a Polish writer who spent time in Auschwitz. His name is Tadeusz Borowski, and the collection of stories is called This Way to the Gas, Ladies and Gentlemen. And it's really, really difficult reading, and it's really hard to read with students, it, but it's also very important. And then um, the students really respond. And there's a, a, um, a, a, a there's trauma is described through food too, right? Um, and in this uh, this series of short stories, the uh, the author or the hero of these stories, um, he he occupies a position of authority in the camps as a prisoner, and he has access to food. And there's a description, a passage where he describes eating tomatoes and mustard and some um, bread on a bunk and underneath him there are withered bodies of, of his uh, camp um, um, inmates who are dying of, of starvation and hunger. And that stark contrast is really horrifying because it, it's a moment where um, we see the kind of utter breakdown of any kind of moral universe and a, uh, um, a sort of um, an, an effort on the individual to simply survive at, at all costs, right? To um, not think of the other, but rather think only of oneself, a kind of ultimate egoism. Um, and then I also, so as we, we, as we deal with this, um, uh, there's a, there's, there's, it's hard to get out of these texts and how do I work with students with them. And uh, one way is I use uh, other testimony, um, and uh, in this case by another um, inmate of Auschwitz, um, the Italian Jew Primo Levi, uh, a mathematician um, who wrote many different uh, books about this. Uh, one is called Survival in Auschwitz. And he talks about when the camps were liberated, and he and some of his, uh, his um, um, inmate friends, or, or I, it's hard, right, friendships, it's not really friends in the, in the concentration camp, uh, but he and a number of other inmates find themselves outside of the, of the uh, camp and have to fend for themselves, right? And they find some food, but they also need some effort to get firewood and, and to, and to um, uh, build a shelter and so on. And as they're sitting down to um, eat after having done this work, one of them says, we should give more food to our friends who have brought this, uh, who've done more work because they're probably hungry. And for Primo Levi said, this was the moment that I felt like the concentration camp was over because suddenly we were caring for one another and we were thinking about the other as opposed to simply trying to survive at all costs and ignore um, the other. And then if we think about um, uh, hunger, um, we also need to think about um, our own country. When we talk about genocide, uh, we have to think about the foundational uh, history of our own country, right? And the fact that we're on land that was once occupied um, by the Native Americans who were uh, decimated and surely through hunger in many ways. Um, so that's something we, we need to remember. And we also need to remember the, uh, the, the concurrent situation in Iowa, the fact that one in 11 children uh, face hunger um, seems to me to be also something worth noting and something that really uh, requires us to think about um, what, we, uh, what we do and um, how we should, um, uh, or how we're also implicated in this. If we, if we see this, right, if we know this, um, we can't really be um, 
uh, indifferent to this. Or to put it another way, as a, as a um, Polish Jewish uh, scholar who's visited Grinnell many times uh, says, his name is uh, Kostek Gebert, he says that there are no innocent bystanders to genocide, right? So once you've read this, once you've seen this, once you know this, then there's a certain um, implication, right, that we need to do something. And so one of the phrases that I've, I've come up with um, in, in teaching this kind of literature of trauma, especially when it involves food, was this phrase, uh, we're complicit when we eat. Um, in other words, if we're sitting, again, if we're sitting ha sharing food, we need to be thinking of those who have not. Now, this is some pretty heavy stuff to uh, put down for or lay, on, lay on students. Um, and so um, when, I th when I talk about it, um, you know, of course, it doesn't mean that we're not supposed to eat anymore, right? I mean, it's, it's something we still have to do, but it offers a kind of a way to respond, okay? And in this sense, um, I want to think about um, um, this next part of, uh, or, or what, do, what do we do, right? And I use what is to be done. We're doing on top, okay. Um, what is to be done is, fr is from Russian history. There's many different moments in Russian history where they, s they say, what? is to be done, right? Um, what do we do now? And I, I talk with students about this, and it seems to me that the work that we do in the kitchen offers a possible response, right? Um, that is, let's feed people, right? And so in my course, um, we, um, we s make efforts to both feed each other in class, right? But we also uh, work to feed the community and to participate in various aspects of um, addressing food insecurity in, in the Grinnell community. My tutorial in the fall of 2015 uh, prepared the Davis uh, community meal. Um, so we had um, borscht and we had uh, beef stroganoff and, and some other dishes. Um, we also um, are, are working on uh, participating in the um, the community meal across the street here, um, and also with other different kinds of, of food efforts in an attempt to create good food stories, right? So if there are bad food stories, we have to think about uh, making a good food stories. Another example of what uh, my students and I put together is um, represented here in an event that maybe some of you know about, um, and that is uh, Slavic Coffee House. This is a um, long been a part of the Russian department's tradition every year. It's sort of grown into a, a, a pretty elaborate affair, um, and, um, and it becomes a place for students to um, sort of think about feeding the community and coming together and offering uh, food to uh, students, staff, faculty, and to the Grinnell College community. Um, and it offers a way to make a difference um, and to take action, right? Um, the um, uh, the uh, this this event used to be as I said it, it's been here a long time. Um, we've also combined it with the celebration of of Maslenitsa, which is a kind of a Russian version of Mardi Gras, and so we share this food together, and then we go out into uh, outside, and we have an effigy of winter. It's a a big straw figure. It's actually or made out of refuse from my garden, so it's a way for me to burn uh, things legally. Um, I do notify the fire department um, and campus safety. Um, and we, we afterwards, and this is part of an ancient uh, Slavic tradition, uh, East Slavic, Russian, Ukrainian, Belarusian. Um, and, it, and it represents a, a moment of welcoming spring and chasing away winter, right? It's an effigy of winter. And those pancakes, right, that, that we saw earlier are very much a part of that celebration and they're representations of the sun and have a real uh, deep meaning for uh, Slavic uh, people uh, from the Slavic uh, cultures, right? Um, okay. Now, um, in the newspaper article or in my description of what I was going to do today, I said I would share my own food story or one of my food stories, and I think I'm still okay on time. Um, and that is the story of this soup, right? Uh, borscht. Um, if I were to say uh, this is a Russian soup, would that seem like a reasonable statement, right? This is, you've heard about it, Russian soup. Actually, she is probably not a soup you immediately think of, right? 
Um, and, and I learned that picture in that kitchen at the very beginning of, uh, of, this, uh, of the second part. Uh, I learned how to make this soup in 1983 in Moscow. And I feature it on my food blog, um, which if you're interested, you can read uh, some of my recipes and some of my thinking about food on foodiowa.com. Um, shameless plug. Um, but I call this soup borscht pomaskovsky or Moscow style borscht because that's where I learned how to make it and I thought of it as a Russian soup, right? Um, it turns out that part of the, what I'll call the institutional and disciplinary marginalization of an entire culture, that is Ukrainian culture, I didn't know or I hadn't heard. And again, it wasn't intentional. It was the, the marginalization of Ukraine was so deep as to be unnoticeable. Right? So when we think about institutionalized racism, it's, you just don't see it, right? It's a surprise when you, it, it, you're confronted by it. In the same way, that lack of uh, knowledge or even thought or consideration of Ukraine in my discipline is, is really marked. And I spent the weekend at Amherst College um, at a workshop of uh, professors from liberal arts colleges around the country talking about how do we think about Russian studies, how do we teach in Russian studies, because of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine by Putin and the the current um, uh, war of uh, a war uh, a war that is uh, is uh, where we're seeing war crimes um, and there's ample evidence of of, of a kind of genocidal policy um, and so um, so when I was uh, teaching this uh, course in the fall or in the spring of 22 when the invasion happened. It also came on my radar, and it was starting to become, uh, it was starting to make the headlines. There was a, an effort, um, a proposal that was from uh, fall of 2021, but which came to, to fruition in the spring of 22, is that UNESCO awarded uh, Ukrainian borscht um, as uh, it being on the list of intangible cult uh, items of intangible uh, cultural heritage in need of urgent safeguarding, right? Now, what does that designation mean? Does it mean that borscht isn't, shouldn't be made in Russia or that, you know, somehow that's wrong? No, it's, it's not saying that, right? It's rather emphasizing the fact that Ukrainian borscht is a part of Ukrainian identity, and it's a very deep, has a very deep meaning, and it, it's linked to Ukrainian um, cultural identity in a way that it's uh, borscht isn't in the same way with Russia. Russia actually, there's a there's a soup there called shi that we've talked about already that does represent that uh, quintessential Russian identity. It's not to say that borscht isn't made in Russia. It is. You can get it in any uh, dining hall, and there was a a real sort of uniformity to what was available in the Soviet Union because of central planning, and you could be in Vladivostok uh, on the very f in the very far east, or in Almaty in Kazakhstan, or in Saint Petersburg, and get borscht and a number of other similar dishes. Right. So there was a, a, a sort of a uniformity of what was available. But what it does uh, what it does um, emphasize is that this is something that is a uniquely or, or that is positioned in Ukrainian cultural identity is something very important. And um, the, the declaration was met with some uh, scorn on the part of Russian authorities. They were accused of fascism and so on. And again, um, I, 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 for me, it, it, I think it's important to acknowledge a culture's um, uh, symbols uh, without becoming defensive and wanting to have them for yourself, right? And I think we're seeing this in a number of different ways in the case of, of Russia's aggression vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ukraine. Um, this is a, um, a, a relief worker or someone who fled Kiev at the beginning of the war and she's feeding uh, borscht to um, refugees. And I, I have to say it was all I could do not to get on a plane and fly to Poland and find a kitchen where I could volunteer. World Central Kitchen is an organization that's been doing some of this work and, and I, I donate to them and, and I, you know, it's something that's, that's real and it's, uh, it's a real need. Um, the, the soup that I've made is, I've been making it at Grinnell since I got here, so it's a, a 30 year a tradition. The, the recipe is used in the dining hall on uh, every other Friday for Russian table where we go and speak Russian together. 
um, Chef Scott Turley um, uh, took my recipe and, and has adapted it, uh, adapted it for the dining hall. Um, and then on the other Fridays, we have she. So both are represented, and which is a really nice thing. Um, and, uh, and sort of recognizes that difference, okay. Um, and I've also, as I've been following um, the, the war and as, as it's um, um, and in many events, in fact, it's a daily um, part of my, of my reading and, and listening, um, I've noted a number of moments. So, for example, when some of the um, Ukrainian um, villages and so on were being liberated in, in the offensive uh, last uh, summer, um, the first thing that um, these uh, grandmothers would say as the soldiers were entering their village is, let me make you some borscht. Um, and it wasn't soup. It was it. They said, let me make you some borscht. Um, and there's also really touching images of, of the um, sort of the mess hall on the front, and there's, uh, they're making borscht in these giant sort of field kettles um, on, on the front lines. So it's become for, you know, it, 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 I've, I see the um, meaning of it in a different way s because of this war, um, and I've, I, I need to go back to my blog uh, and I'm working on this to uh, revise that particular recipe, or at least acknowledge this uh, this aspect of it. Um, the last thing, the last couple slides, and I think I'm right about on time, um, is so um, we have three Ukrainian students on campus right now, two first years, and in August of 20, uh, or last August, um, the three of them came into my office along with uh, Khandamir. Um, Imam Nazarov, who's here on the left, an uh, Uzbek student. Um, and um, it was a, a, an interesting moment when they, they walked in and, you know, uh, wanted to meet me and they had uh, some questions. And I started with, you know, we, can we speak, you know, can we, we can speak Russian. And one of the Ukrainians says, why Russian, right? Because it's, it's a tense moment. So I immediately switched to Polish or Polish because I speak Polish too, right? So it, it sort of diffused the situation. But um, what, uh, what they asked is we'd like to commemorate Ukrainian Independence Day. Um, and we'd like to prepare some food if that's possible. They came to the right place, right? I, I set them up um, in the global kitchen. And here, um, what I, what I, what's really marvelous for me in this picture is, uh, so this is uh, an Uzbek student, a Russian student, a Ukrainian student, a Russian student, and a Russian student all together making food together and we were and we shared this food with the community and i'll show i'll show you an image of that um we have that's a really difficult um uh, it's really difficult in terms of how do we describe this region and how do we describe the students from this region right and you know they're russian speaking but what do we call them russophone students i mean that's not really doesn't really seem appropriate um, uh, they were trying to develop a student organization, and one of the one of the ideas was OOPS, uh, the Organization of Post-Soviet Students, um, <laughs> which I thought was clever. But one of our other Uzbek students says, "No, I don't want to be identified as Soviet. Right? I want to be Uzbek." So we're still struggling with how to think of a group that brings together those students. One of the ways we're doing it is we, are have, we have a newsletter and each of our Russian-speaking students is presenting a, a short text in their own language, in their first language, then in Russian, and then in English to kind of highlight the fact that these are students who have a very different kind of background and, and it's, worth, it's, very much, it's very important to recognize that. Um, and so they made this borscht. They're making it right now. Um, they're making with with meat. I make a, a a vegan version. It's sort of the the sort of lowest common denominator and easy to to feed to student crowds without asking about dietary restrictions. But the original uh, recipe for Alina and her family involves pork, right? And so we get into really interesting questions about authenticity and who owns a recipe and so on in in this course, course which are always interesting conversations, and on. On that, on August 24th, um, during New Student Days, we uh, made the borscht. Um, we served it to the community. 
The beets were from um, uh, Steve Graham's garden. He uh, supplied us, he's a campus safety officer, and he supplied us with a lot of produce over the summer. The sunflowers you see there are from Marvin Garden. Um, I'm uh, on the board of Imagine Grinnell, and I, my role there is to um, coordinate at Marvin Garden. And if you're interested in helping out there, we're having a cleanup day on Saturday from 9 to 12, uh, no pressure. Um, just thought I would get that out there. Um, and so this was a really marvelous event that brought together students um, in community, shared some information about Ukraine with the broader community, um, and also brought students together from uh, that may have uh, faced some challenges in, in communicating with each other given the current uh, state of affairs in, in the war. Um, uh, so uh, I think uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and, and stop there. Uh, oh, I'm going to last one. So I had on my first slide an image of this uh, this angel, uh, Amelia. Uh, uh, this is uh, Olga's granddaughter and my granddaughter too. Um, I've always cooked with my kids, and and I've also started cooking with Amelia. And I I have the captions here. This is what she's saying. I hope it. I, I don't. Sometimes the uh, films don't travel. I'm late. Yeah, I'm making donuts. Like who? The Todd. <laughs> so, so you got to start them early. Um, so I would, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Diakuyu, spasiba. Um, and those are my two boys. I wanted to get them in there too. Just to, uh, all right. And I don't, I think I have time for a couple questions maybe. Yeah, we do have time for a couple questions or food stories or whatever? Uh, as an academic, I wonder uh, about um, the novelty of your pedagogy of food. you know of other institutions that are doing anything like this? Well, there's the University of Vermont, all right? Um, and this is, so uh, part, of, uh, part of what drove my um, um, my uh, strategies in teaching this way was to generate numbers, right? Because I've been here for 29 years and students aren't taking languages as much anymore. The humanities have been suffering. So, you know, you're, we're constantly trying to find courses that appeal to a broad audience. I've been a humanities professor for 29 years. The only course I've ever turned students away from was this one. And I had one semester I had 59 students sign up for uh, 15 slots. That felt pretty good. Um, <laughs> so the novel, and so it is, and so other colleagues around the country have been doing this. I was inspired by colleagues at other institutions, uh, Dara Goldstein at um, Williams, Angela, Brill Angela Brintlinger at Ohio State. There's someone doing this at Oberlin. So it's, it's, it's catching on, but nobody has a kitchen lab in the middle of an academic institution with a full, full staff and infrastructure. And so when I'm telling other colleagues about this, for example, at this workshop last weekend, they're, they're green with envy. It's really, it's, it's a good feeling, yeah. I'm, I'm seeing a future bucket course at, at the kitchen, I, I just uh, think. I would be delighted. <laughs> I would be delighted. Are there other questions? None hey. of my comrades, maybe. Question. Thank you so much, All right. Professor Armstrong. And thank you. <laughs> thank you. I should have mentioned Joan. My. We friend. will see you have a wonderful spring, should it arrive, and and a great summer. And just keep your eyes peeled for news of bucket course uh, beginning dates in the fall. Thank you again.